29. I know the Lord. Everybody have it? Let us sing. I know the Lord will find a way for me. I know the Lord will find a way for me. If I walk in heaven's light, shine the wrong and do the right. I know the Lord will find a way for me. The Lord has said, Go. Sometimes we say that and still hear phones after we get started. Make sure you got them on silent. Again, one, I have one thing to, one announcement, I guess we need to make that later on because, uh, but, but while it's on my mind, but there's, a, there's a limb hanging from the tree in the corner of this fence, so right outside, uh, down the hill there. And so. Now make sure you don't get too close to that tree because if the limb falls, we don't want anybody to get hurt. You know, and then there's a good possibility that it can fall. So we need, we're need we gonna try to get it down, get it on down, uh, the first chance that we get. Uh, but however, just want everybody to be aware that, that the tree is hanging there and the possibility that it could come on down. At this time, let us have a call for worship. Uh, repeat after me, please. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Let the words of my mouth, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, o Lord my, rock, my rock and my redeemer. And my redeemer. Is there anyone to make a confession this morning? 
there anyone to make a confession? Anyone to, to ask for prayer? Well, I would just like to ask uh, Chaplain Grace for Antoine and his uh, wife. They're flying down to Atlanta tomorrow, and that uh, they'll visit the place when they're in that. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank Let's notice on uh, page 63 in the supplementary book, page 63. And also I think uh, that late who, who, whoever prays, but you also pray for my traveling grace as well. Uh, I'll be heading uh, for Los Angeles that week. This Wednesday, this is Tuesday. So I pray for my safe travel. For my soul. Take six to three. Okay, if I have it, let's say. Restore my spirit, Lord. I need restore. My heart is weary. And please help me. Oh, that. 
Give them their help also, Lord, that they stand in need of, uh, and let them be able to return to church with us also. Uh, Brother Dinsmore, Lord, just continue to bless Brother Dinsmore, Lord, and let everything be well, uh, well with him. Let him overcome his health issues also, Lord. And we also pray for Sister Williams, Lord, uh, that had to leave this morning, Lord. We ask that you would just bless her, Lord, with her health issues, Lord, and let everything be right with her, Lord, and uh, let her be able to come overcome her health situations too, Lord. And we also come praying, Lord, for the ones that's not here and the ones that have no intention of being here, Lord, that you would just bless them, give them a new mind, Lord, and let them come back to the church and work out their salvation with fear and trembling, for it's everlasting too late, Lord. For Amen. salvation lies in the church of Christ, Lord, and in the church of Christ only. We pray on behalf of uh, Sister Betty Robinson this morning, Lord, uh, that underwent surgery, Lord, uh, uh, that's having repercussions from the uh, surgery, Lord. We ask that you would just relinquish the pains that she carries with her, Lord, and let her be able to adjust, Lord, and everything uh, uh, be well with her also this morning, Lord. And we ask that you would just uh, let us be able to help one another, Lord. We pray that we love one another, Lord, and we also pray, Lord, that uh, we would uh, uh, help each other along the way, Lord, as needed, that we see, that we could strengthen somebody, pray that we could encourage somebody, Lord, in a manner that's pleasing and acceptable unto you, Lord. We pray that you go with us, be with us, Lord, keep us from uh, hurt and harm and danger. And uh, when the last day comes, Lord, and you open the Lamb's Book of Life, we pray that you will be able to look at each and every one of us and say, well done, that good and faithful service, Lord. And we pray the prayers that we uh, uh, ask in your son Jesus' name. Let us all say, amen. 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 Good morning, everybody. Good morning. If you have it, if you have number 131, let us sing. I was sinking deep and sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea Heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me, I say.
They tried my Lord, tried my Lord and Master with no one to with no one to be faith within the heart of
invitation will be number 270. Once again, the song of invitation will be number 270. Be marking him for number 270. Through church, once again, say amen. Amen. Of course, we know we have a friend greater than a friend in Jesus Christ. Even our best kept friends, they are not going to make the sacrifice Christ made for us on the cruel cross of Calvary. I don't know anybody that has ever existed from Adam to this very day that will be spit upon for you, that will be humiliated for you, that will be beaten for you and crucified for you specifically. So we know that we can sing that song with great conviction, joy, and appreciation in our hearts. Because there's only one that ever fulfilled that bill. And that was Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. So thank you for coming out to worship God in spirit and in truth. And for all that you do behind the scenes here to make the Henry Street Church of Christ the the congregation that it is. And we're so grateful to have you as our church family and our friends. Thank you as well if you're joining us as well as visitors, whether you're physically here or on our broadcast. You are certainly our honored guest, and we want to continue to invite you to our worship and fellowship with us once again. Of course, we know that nobody loves you more than Jesus. We're excited to see you here, but I guarantee you, he is elated that you're here as well, especially if you give your life over to him, which we all must do in order to make it unto heaven. I thank my my Lord for my wife for her continued love and support and all the brothers who who work together as one team, our elders, for their leadership as well, and all our sisters for all that you do for us as well. Won't be long here today, at least that's not my plan. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I'm going to honor that, but I'm going to try to get there. Amen. 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 Because I forgot my watch. That's the most, the worst thing you can do as a preacher is forget your watch. Amen. And y'all made a mistake too because you don't have no clock standing there. So that's on y'all. Amen. So we're going to win this by feel <laughs> and see how far we go. But most of all, I know that's humor, but at the end of the day, it's about what God deserves. Amen. Because again, at the end of the day, this is still God's day. Amen. Still the Lord's day. It's not my day. No matter what my stomach may be saying and grumbling and all that. It ain't all about that. Yeah. See, I learned from Matthew 4. I know that the teens were studying that today, that Jesus said specifically, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So obviously, we're more inclined to be spiritually minded, no matter what our thoughts may be from a fleshly standpoint. But if you will, let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 42. I want to deal with something, see, as my mentor, uh, Ronald Cross, used to teach us. There are times that you have to teach the church what they need and not necessarily what they want. And, of course, that didn't just come from his wisdom. That came from what was taught to Timothy. As Timothy was taught in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 and verse number 2, that he had to preach things in season and what? Out of season. That he is reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine he was taught to do. So that's the preacher's handbook. And that's what we're going to actually go through here today. Now, what I want you to do, though, you that are the faithful few that are present here today, I don't want you to take this personal. But I want you to take this in a way that reinforces what you're already doing. And trying to go to the next level. But at the end of the day, I also want you to do from the scriptures, not me, but God's word. That is to encourage others to do what you're doing this morning. This is going to make complete sense as we get into the worship service here today. Because if you are not strong in Christ, you can look around you right now. And this small gathering would discourage you. Because you're not tuned into what is real, what I'm talking about is, what matters is what you do with Christ. You as an individual have got to answer to him at the end of the day, no matter what other people are spiritually doing right now. Because I'm going to be honest with you, and I hope I can talk to you as family. we got a lot of folks, even in the midst of our congregation here today, that are spiritually asleep this morning. I'm not just talking about from the, the, the body standpoint. I'm talking discerned. 
that is unconcerned, that is, I should say, about their salvation. Unconcerned about their commitment to Christ and not committed like they should. You know, when you look at the world around you, that should drive you to Christ, not away from it. Our society is changing so much and becoming so evil these days that you got to start differentiating yourself from the world saying, look, Lord, the world is going that way, but I'm not with them. Amen. And not only am I saying that, but I'm doing that. And you're, the first thing you're going to see me doing is I'm going to be present on Sunday mornings. Amen. 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 There's nothing going to stop me yes, from being present on Sunday mornings. I would have to have lost a lung. My heart would have had to stop for me not to be here. Oh, y'all know what I'm talking about here today. Amen. And I'm just trying to show you in preview before getting too deep in the message where we're going with this. So I encourage you to go back to chapter 2, verse 42, for me, please. And I'm going to read out of the New King James Version. Thank you, Brother Presley, for the wonderful job you've done with it. But let me redo it for emphasis sake, memory sake, and even for my own personal sake. Give me a moment here to wet my throat a minute, and we'll get into it. The Word of God says out of Acts chapter 2, verse 42, out of the New King James Version. And again, remember our context. God is talking about what the church did as an example unto us. So he's not just talking about the world in general. He's talking specifically about the church of Christ then and also what needs to be done now in imitation of what they did. So Acts 2 verse 42, when you're ready for the word of God, somebody say amen. amen. The word of God says, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. In the breaking of bread and in prayers. I'm going to, if God allows it to be so. Now remember I'm saying I, but I'm really saying if God allows me. That all right, y'all? Because I can't do anything without God's approval. So what I'm going to try to do is divide this message in two parts. Part one will be today and the conclusion will be next week. And that will be simply entitled, You Can't Live Off the Grid in the Church. You can't live off the grid in the church. You're going to find out what that means in just a moment. Mm -hmm. But if you're not familiar with how the world uses the word off the grid, it normally has two connotations. That means it has two definitions that it goes by. The strict definition, the proper definition of living off the grid means to live without electricity. That is, you're trying to live the old-fashioned way, traditional ways, off the land, all those type of things without any type of electricity being generated. So that means you would have no refrigeration. You would have no video games. Amen, y'all. You wouldn't have anything that we're so used to, you will feel lost nowadays. And trying to live off the land and completely without electronics. I think if we did that, your children would lose their minds. <laughs> they would not know what to do with themselves. Amen. 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 Because they didn't come up with parents like we did, where our parents sent us outside, Amen. and there was no choice in the matter. Amen. 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 Boy, you better go outside and run off that energy. You are getting on my nerves, and you wanted to do that because you didn't want the bed. Oh, y'all don't know what I'm right. talking about because you did not have... That type of parent, amen, y'all. So you went outside, you scarred up your knees, amen, y'all. You did everything it took. You came back sweaty, dirty, and musty. <laughs> and you had to get in the bathtub or the shower. Amen, that's the kind of family I came up with. I don't know what y'all came up with then. But hygiene was important, amen. Yes. To us, so we would get out there and we would be kids. So we had at least some degree of an experience of what? Living off the green man. So that in its strictest sense means to live without electronics at all. But now there's another way that people use that word. That wording also means to live in seclusion from other people. That is, you're trying to be a loner out there. You're trying to do everything by yourself without the company of other people. Now, I understand why some folk do this. 
I understand it's easier to be out there by yourself in seclusion than have to go through all this city life drama that you go through. Yeah. Huh? You don't have to hear a whole bunch of cars out there. You don't have to worry about nobody trying to get in your house when you leave. You don't know what I'm talking yeah. about here yeah. with that. You don't have to worry about all the gossip and all that kind of stuff you, uh, that, that, that people do out there. In other words, you don't go through electronic and social overload that can be when you're around a whole lot of people. So I understand people want to do that for peace in their life. You don't have a lot of noise from people, cars, and all the commotions, again, of city life for being around a whole lot of people. But let me tell you something. That may be what the world does, but when it comes to a Christian, it is not good to live off the grid. When it comes to the church, or all y'all to follow me here today. This is because when we live off the grid, I'm talking about being secluded. Maybe I can take you, take you there for a minute. Sometimes we have Christians that come out of the water, they're excited, they're here for about three or four months, and then you don't see them for three or four years. That is what? Living off the grid. As we're going to explain, in other words, they're trying to live life alone instead of with the fellowship of the church. Huh? And when they do that, they are depriving themselves of the camaraderie of the church, and they don't allow themselves to do for others when they seclude themselves from other Christians. Amen. Oh, amen, y'all. Mm -hmm. For example, the first century church set the precedence of how we are to conduct ourselves as a group. First, we are always to come to worship physically. Amen. Amen. I heard one person. Amen. 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 We're always to personally come out. It's an electronic become. Amen. That's a whole other thing. That was one of my biggest fears. Mm -hmm. We went, to, went through the COVID era yeah. that everybody would be at home trying to watch it yes. instead of being a part of it. Yeah. Because there's a difference between the two. Yes, sir. Am I knocking folks that do that that can't get here? Absolutely not. Yes, sir. I'm commending them because for some reason they may be confined to a nursing home can't get here. So be it. Amen. But everybody ain't in a nursing home. Amen. Huh? Amen. Everybody ain't sick. Amen. Huh? 90% of a congregation cannot vo I go on social media and watch worship service. You got to be a part of it. Oh, you're not doing anything at all. I'm going to show you that as we go forward with this here today. All right, y'all don't feel I'm on your toes at my today. I got to deliver some truth. Because I want to see y'all, I hope you're with me here this morning. We got to rescue some folks. We got to wake some folks up out of their spiritual slumber because we don't know when Christ is coming back. And he can come back at any moment and be so disappointed with 90% of the church. That's out there. Now, I'm not just talking about Henry Street. Henry Street part of it, yes. But I'm talking nationwide yes, that this is going on. That people have gotten too lazy to physically come to worship service. They can walk here. Oh, y'all don't get what I'm talking about. Here today. So let me get back here. Let me go back to where I'm supposed to be. The first century church set the precedence, as I mentioned to you, of how we are to conduct ourselves as a, as a group. So first then, we are always to come physically to worship service and encourage others to do so as well. Amen. People want to talk all around Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. But it doesn't matter how much you talk around it, the truth is still the truth and it cannot be changed. Amen. It gives us some spiritual points useful for our discussion. And we all must keep in mind. We're going to be reading this also out of the New King James Version, and it reads as follows, Hebrews 10, verse 25, you grew up in the church, you know where I'm going with this here today. But sometimes we need a reminder. Look what the Holy Spirit said from the Hebrew writer. This is God speaking, y'all. He said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Church, help me with this here. What is the assembly? The assembly is worship service. The topic is worship service. It's what he's talking about here today. You have to understand that from the very beginning of the church, folks got lazy yes, sir. and stopped coming. Yes, sir. This is a 2,000 year old problem yeah. right. that is just getting worse and worse by every generation. Yeah. 
Amen. that we encounter. Amen. He was dealing with God, was dealing with them getting lazy about worship service themselves. And so what did he say? He's trying to get them back in order. He said, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. What did he say next? As is the matter of some of the words, you're doing it right now. That's why you're talking to them. Huh? But instead of doing this, what else did he say? He says, but exhorting one another. Exhorting means to encourage other people to do the right thing. And why? He tells you why. He says, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The gospel translators, if you notice something in that definition, look at that word day. What do you see special about that? It's capitalized. So that means this is more important than a day of independence for the United States. It's more important even than the day that you were born. Because nobody's got a capital day on their birthday. Huh? So what day are we talking about? We're talking about the day of Christ coming back. Huh? He said that each day you live, the closer and closer we come before seeing Jesus face to face. You don't know when that day is going to come. So he's saying what? Encourage everybody to stay in worship. Oh, y'all, come on now. Stay in worship service. And please, pay. this ain't part of my script. I'm going off script. That's all right, y'all. Quit telling your kids you have the choice as to whether you come or not. Huh? You, the parents, not them. They live under your roof, sucking in your air. Huh? Enjoying your heat. You putting clothes on day back. Huh? You taking them to school. You taking them to sport. You taking them to bed. You feeding them three times a day and even more. And then you're going to tell them, well, John, you have the choice. I wish I had a child. That's, that's why I said, I don't think that's why the reason why I got no child. God said, you'd be too hard on me. Amen. Because I would get them and shake them. No, you're not standing in bed. Not that why you my son. And under my roof, eating my food. Amen. See, I make up my own homemade scripture. Like they say, if a man don't work, you don't eat. If you don't go to church, you don't eat. Amen. That would be my room. In my house. Hey, my stomach hurt. Well, you better get up. Or you ain't eating today. Amen. See, I know that's humorous, but sometimes you got to take some extreme measures sometimes. Amen, y'all. So let me go back into this real quick. Let me say it in a serious tone. Not forsaking. The assembling of ourselves together as is the matter of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. So what did we just see? God wants us to come together because we are the family of God. Yes, sir. It is overwhelming how many times God calls us sons, children, and the gospel writers call us brethren. Mm -hmm. So physically coming together declares to the world our unity as God's family. Amen, y'all. Yeah. I know, unfortunately, that as I mentioned to you earlier, and I'm going to keep stressing it because it's the truth. I know that laziness has gotten into us because of the virtual worship services available out there enacted during the emergency years of the COVID pandemic. But don't play COVID with me today. Huh? I'm going to be a man for a minute. You ain't COVID when you go into the grocery store. Huh? You ain't COVID when you go and buy a car. Huh? You're not COVID when Miss So Fine call you. Huh? No, you covet because you want her. You ain't COVID. Then you'll get out in a minute anytime she calls. Yes, sir. Huh? Ain't worried about no COVID. Then I can't be with them because COVID's still out there. Man, as much as you do. Don't come here with that lie. Amen. Amen. COVID ain't stopping you from doing nothing. COVID didn't stop you when it was full blown. Ain't neither. One of the same ones wasn't wearing no mask. Stuff full blown. Ain't got no vaccine. Going everywhere. But I can't come to the church. The folks might give me something. Y'all be fearing you, amen. amen. <laughs> it's real. Yes, what it goes on here today. I'm just telling y'all the truth now. Amen. It just lays in excuses. Let's call it what it is. Amen. However, true worship 
is a collection of live people together in a non-electronic format. Yes, sir. Use virtual when you are sick and not able to come and stay connected and encouraged. That's the only time you use that stuff. Yes, sir. Don't make that your way to worship it because that ain't what God put in the Bible. Amen. I don't see nobody. Come on now. Let's be real with yeah. this. I don't see nobody in the first century with an iPad. No, sir. Not a laptop. Yeah. Not a phone. I don't see none of that. See, if Paul was living today, he'd probably tell you, put down your phone and get in the building. Amen. Huh? Put down your iPad and get here. Get up and put some clothes on. Amen, y'all. Get out the bed. This is my day, not your day, God will be saying. Please, please give God your best. Amen, somebody. I'm going to talk to somebody here today. But when it comes to that virtual worship service stuff, never use it as a replacement for the collective worship we must have together. Moving forward, notice God tells us to exhort. This is on the church's part now. And notice when he's talking, he ain't just talking to the minister. He's not just talking to the elders. He's not just talking to the deacon. He's talking to the whole church. He's telling all of us do this. He's telling us to what? Encourage each other to come to the collective worship service. See, who do you know that hasn't been coming? Get on the phone with them and encourage them to come. See, how can we encourage others to come to worship when we don't consistently do it ourselves? Amen. It doesn't make sense. See, worship is also a part of fellowship, which means to make those strong bonds of brotherly love that God calls for from all of us. See, you can't plug in electronically and develop real relationships with others. See, the phone screen blocks you from making real connections. The laptop monitor is a barrier to true friendships. Electronic words on the screen to each other are not real conversations. No, sir. So don't neglect worship service in person when you have the power to be in person. Amen. See, all churches right now, as I mentioned to you earlier, are experiencing people not coming back to worship services physically across the country because of the convenience of virtual worship services. Amen. Don't be a part of that number. You strong now, but don't you dare say, I'm going to change that up. Amen. Don't be a part of that number. Be the part that physically comes back to worship service because that is the way yes, sir. that God designed. Oh, I hope I'm talking yeah. to somebody here today. Yeah. If not reinforcing you here today. See, moving on. We also do not want to live off the grid as a Christian. Meaning to not make true friendship with others in the church because that does not promote unity as mentioned earlier. Let's deal with that for a moment. Remember what Ephesians chapter 4 verse 3 says. Endeavoring. Let me put it that far. Yes, sir. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit won't step from us, who is God. In the bond of what? Peace. I mean, you got to get along. Mm -hmm. You, by being present in not only worship services, but all activities of the church, send a message to the world. Yes, sir. Just using the political word as an example, when you see people speaking out against injustices and denial of fundamental human rights, what do they do? When people are trying to stand up against civil rights in this world, what do they do? They march together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm? How effective would they be with a ragtag group that's going here and there? Yeah. You got to have unity yes, to make a difference in this world. The same thing with what? The church. Mm -hmm. See, just like political action, we send the following message by physically being with each other and bonding like the first century church did. Yes, being together sends the message that we are one. It sends the message that we are thinking alike. It sends the message that we're going to make a difference in this world. It sends the message that we are the children of God. It sends the message that Jesus is our Savior collectively. And it certainly sends the message that we love each other. Amen. So when you are absent in the lives of other Christians, not in any church activities, you start to minimize that message. Amen. You start to tell the world it's not that important. So you are part of this spiritual army, also known as the church. If you are absent, the army shrinks yes. and becomes weaker as a team in fighting the spiritual works of darkness out there. Mercy. So remember, you are wanted and you are needed as a team member in Christ and a soldier in the Lord. Yes. Moving forward one more time and shortly come to a close. A third and final reason why we cannot live off the grid when it comes to the church, that means a seclusion away from other Christians, 
is that we are not taking in the word of God as we are supposed to when we are excluded from others. What does this mean? Well, we must understand that a huge part of our being a, a person pleasing and acceptable to God is to hear the scriptures expounded in our understanding. Remember, preaching and listening to God's word is part of the worship service, which is told to us in Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. So when you miss, you miss that. See, Acts chapter 20, verse number 7 gives us a quick summary of what happens on the day of worship every Sunday. It says, now on the first, what, day of the week, what day is that? That's Sunday. I'm sorry, my friends, in the, in the seventh day of Venice camp, they didn't meet on Saturday. The Bible says they met on what? The first day of the week. So we have to follow the biblical example. That's what men think we ought to be doing. It says what? Not on the first day of the week. When what happened? The same thing as the assembly in Hebrews 10, 25 happened here. What did it say? When the disciples, who are they? I hope you say that's me. It's God's people. It says, when the disciples came together to what? Break bread. That's another word for what? The Lord's Supper. Yes, Paul, what did he do? Ready to depart the next day. Spoke unto them. What do we call that today? Preaching. Mm -hmm. And what? Continued his message until what? Mm -hmm. Midnight. Paul, you're a better man than me. I can't go to midnight. Amen, y'all. <laughs> and y'all ain't gonna listen till midnight. Amen, y'all. It's like Brother Mitchell told me when we first got here. He said, you can preach as long as you want, but we leaving at 11 o'clock. Amen, y'all. <laughs> so I understand what he meant by that now. And the older I get, the less longs I have. Amen, y'all. I give you a good 20 to 40, but that's it. But I can't preach like Paul. I ain't going to midnight. Amen, y'all. So we don't expect you to be sitting here until midnight. We're not trying to hold you until midnight because our services are brief and don't take much of your day. Also remember, you benefit from being here because wisdom is imparted to you through the preaching. This is where you grow in your knowledge and understanding what God wants from you. See, if we, are not, if we are not that he is growing in the knowledge of God's word, he is very disappointed with us. And we cannot truly discern between good and evil. Amen, y'all. Satan got so many lies out there right now that people are calling good evil and evil good. Amen. They can't tell the difference between what is right and wrong. You know, it's so funny. I was watching, watching on YouTube. I saw a headline of a Ugandan president when he was recently uh, interviewed by Kamala Harris. And one of the things he did to throw off Kamala Harris is what it was this. He made a simple comment. You folks can't tell what is a man and a woman today. Well, the question that was on the table, yes. the most simple question on the table yeah. that we knew since Genesis chapter number one man. was he asked the question, what is a man? Mm -hmm. What is a woman? Mm -hmm. And she could not respond in affirmative. Well, Amen. Amen. Yes. Because of why? The LGBTQ mess. Right. That's out there spinning folk head around. Yes, sir. They can't tell you whether they're male or female, binary, non-binary. What? In one but two genders from the beginning? You can't be nothing in between or in transition to anything. Either you're one or the other. Yes, sir. I'm going to tell you something. God knew it anyway. Yes, sir. I don't know. Ooh, I should really go here, but I'm going to do it anyway. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you know when you a man, you're trying to transform into a woman, you are the ugliest thing on the planet? Man, man, man. My God. Man. Now, what is that? <laughs> what puts you in that dress with them legs? Man. Some ugly stuff out there. True. You wasn't designed for that. Man. That's why you don't look good. In that, Amen. I don't care what plastic surgery you get, you still look a hot mess. <laughs> Let me leave it alone. Let me leave it alone. I probably gonna have a child tomorrow. That's all right. I'd rather preach and go to heaven than have a paycheck. Amen. It is what it is. I don't fear that kind of stuff. Amen, y'all. If I had to, I'm gonna make it tense like Paul did. I do something. It just had to be something else. Amen, y'all. Because the only one preacher talking about this stuff. Yes. Nowadays. Well, see, if you don't know the word of God, then you will be confused by everything out there. Amen. And to be honest with you, the less exposed you have with the word, it's like the old saying goes, if you don't use it, you lose it. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. So if you're AWOL from the church, 
If you're missing an action from the church, you're going to start forgetting what God told you, and you'll become just as naive as a newborn baby. Amen. And people will run all over you Amen. with the lies of Satan. Amen, y'all. I'm telling you the truth. That's why God got upset. We look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 20, verse number 14. Now, obviously, they, had not, they were not studying their Bible. So he's talking to Christians in this. He said this in Hebrews 5, verse 20, verse number 14. He said, for though by this time you ought to be what? Teachers. Who is he talking to? He's not talking to the world. He's talking to church. Yeah. You ought to be able to tell people book, chapter, and verse yes, sir. on some things. Yes. But what had happened with them, they had to go back because now they had been so unstudied, they forgot. Yes, He's talking about the church. He says, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again to what? The first principles of the oracles of God. That's another word for God's word. Yes. And you have come to need milk and not solid meat. In other words, I got to go back to the first principles with y'all. Huh? Because you've been so lazy in your study habits. You have forgotten everything. So now we got to go back to step one. Huh? That's what he's saying. You can't even handle the hard things of the Bible. Because now we got to go back to the very stuff that you were originally taught. Man. Amen. He knows the human mind. Yes, sir. When you are not in contact with righteousness, you become unrighteous. Amen. When you're not, not in contact with wisdom, you become not wise anymore. Huh? When you're not in contact with God's word, you go from being strong to weak. Each day, think about it, it's like you're not feeding yourself for a day. So what happens? What happens to you? If you don't feed yourself, you get weaker and weaker and weaker. The body weakens, so does the mind. So does the soul. So does your spiritual strength. It all weakens the less you feed. Look what it says in verse 13. For everyone who partake only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is what? <laughs> they went back to being babes in Christ. Amen, y'all. It's nothing but the truth. And these are the things he's, he's warning us against. Look what he says in verse 14. He says, but solid food belongs to those who are what? Of full age. You can't teach people a greater portion of God's word until they're mature enough to take it. Yes, sir. That's what that's saying. That is, those who by reason of what? Use, not neglect. The, of what? Use of what ha happens to them. Now, he's not talking about your eyes. He's not talking about your ears. He's not talking about what you say. He's talking about your spiritual senses, your spiritual common sense. He says, by who? Those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to what? Discern both good and evil. Discern means to be able to tell the difference. Between good and evil. Amen, y'all. It's kind of like you being a parent and a child. Now, don't expose your family, but how many times have ha you've had a child try to lie well, to you? And you're just looking at them. I mean, man, it's a well-crafted lie. Yes. Amen. Amen. I remember when I was hanging out when I was a young man as a teenager. And I got in late. Well, Amen. Uh -huh. Past my curfew. Yeah. I'm gonna make up the lie. Well, Daddy, I got a, I got, a, I got, a, I got a, I had a spare, uh, flat tire. <laughs> now you know my daddy tried that before me. Yeah. You know that did not work. Because all you had to do was go pop the chart one time. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Where the spare at? Yeah. Boy, you don't even know how to change the tire. Why you lying? <laughs> Who changed it for you? <laughs> what I'm trying to show you is, is my father was able to discern between what good <laughs> and Evil, lies, and the truth. truth. Why? Because he's already exercised that. He's tried that stuff before. Amen. He's come in contact with that stuff before. So that's not going to work on him. Amen. And neither will Satan's lies work on you. I don't care if it comes from Joe Biden. I don't care if it comes from Donald Trump. I don't care if it comes from Barack Obama. I don't care if it comes from the one you sleep with next, day, next to every day. You'll be able to what? Discern between both what? Good and, and evil. Amen, y'all. When the women do come and bat their eyes at you and try to get you to do something, then you'll be able to come back like Joe. You sound like one of the foolish women. Amen. Because you'll be able to what? Discern between good and evil. She didn't cook that nice chicken dinner for you for nothing. She was up to something. Amen. She didn't come out wearing stuff you like to see. For nothing, she was what up to something. So, 
<laughs> Baby, I love that dinner. I thank you for it. But how much money you spend? Amen. Because <laughs> you do what? Discern between good and evil. Amen. Let me hear y'all. Y'all ain't into this. I'm trying. I'm trying hard to preach my heart out. But y'all ain't listening. Amen. Y'all. Nonetheless, we're going to stop here. Because we're going to finish this up on next occasion. That all right, y'all? Amen. I don't know how long I took, but it wasn't long. Amen, y'all. Because I still got breath. Amen. So I'm all right <laughs> here today. But nonetheless, please take it on a serious note. You can't live off the grid. No, sir. Because you have to understand something. This is what people don't understand. Living off the grid and is away from the church is away from Christ as well. Yes. People try to use that excuse nowadays. Well, I still pray. I still do this, but I don't go to church. Well, that means you ain't with Christ. There is no middle ground between the two. How do I know that? Ephesians 5.23 says, The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Tell me how many heads can go without a body. How many bodies can go without a head? Huh? In other words, you are separating yourself from the body, so that means what have you done? You separated yourself from the head. Huh? That means you've also separated yourself from God. Mm-hmm. So every time you sleep in on Sunday morning, guess what? You without Christ. Mm-hmm. Every time you're doing something else in, in, in lieu of coming to worship service, you are literally without Christ at that moment. He didn't separate himself from you. You separate yourself from yeah. him. Huh? Because of laziness or something selfish you wanted to do. Uh-huh. Get up, get out that bed. Get out of your spiritual slumber. It's no time to sleep. I'm scared, y'all. I'm scared. I hope all y'all are scared. I'm talking about that righteous sweat. I'm scared of Matthew 25, where we're talking about the virgins, right? The ten virgins. Some of them slept. Some of them were awake. Some of them got into the marriage feast with the groom. But the other ones was too late because why? They were sleeping in the way. Huh? And we're not just talking about physical sleep. We're talking about being spiritually unconcerned about serving the Lord. Jesus said this is going to happen in Matthew 25. But he did say it has to happen to you. You and I have control over that situation. We don't want to hear him at the end and say, well, uh, we don't want to hear him say, depart from me. I never knew you. Because why? We got spiritually sleepy and we slept through what we need to be doing. Amen, y'all. Truth is the truth. Truth is the truth. Instead, that same chapter talks about in Matthew 25. Matthew 25 talks about those that weren't ready and it also talks about those who were ready. And those that were ready in that same passage of scripture, what did he say? He said what? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So I'm hoping if you're already a child of God, your feet are firmly planted even farther. You are truly that tree planted by the rivers of water. You shall not be moved. If you have fallen short in this, that you have not lived it with any effort in trying to remain with your relation with Christ, it's not too late. God, you have hope right now. All you got to do is make it up in your mind, I'm going to be a different person. Amen. My seat in the pew is not going to be empty any further. Amen, y'all. Truth Amen. is the truth. God, from here on out, is going to get the best of me. That is, I'm going to be that Revelation 12, verse number one, church, uh, verse number one uh, scripture that we quote all the time, where Paul said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your what? Reasonable service. Since Jesus died on that cross of Calvary for me who did not deserve it, it's reasonable. Amen. It makes sense that I'm here every Sunday morning, physically, to give him my all. Yes, sir. He gave more than I ever can give back to him. So let me at least show him some appreciation. Yes, sir. By giving him the thanks and the praise every Sunday morning. Yes. It's the truth, y'all. So with that being said, we're going to transition thoughts. If you're a Christian that's fallen short, you have done anything that you know that would separate you from God called sin, it's time to come back to him before it's everlasting to you. Amen. Most of you can tell me exactly what we need to do with that. It's written. It's Acts 8, 22 and 1 John 1, 7, verse number 10 that you got to repent. 
Confess your fault to God and ask to forgive you. He's going to forgive you right then and there. From there, you'll be out of your spiritual slumber. You'll be alive again and walking with Jesus all the way through the pearly gates of heaven if you stay faithful unto death. If you're not a child of God, please don't let this golden opportunity pass you by. <coughs> There's a sad story that Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, I believe around 13 and verse number 14. He says that most are going to uh, travel the way to destruction. They're going to take the wide gate. Yes, but those that take the narrow gate, that means a narrow entrance of the heaven. There's going to be few that find it. But you found it. You're at it right now. You're at the gate that can lead you to heaven. That's what Jesus is talking about. John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He is the road to get there. He's the only way that you're going to have peace with God. The only way that God is going to put down uh, his separation from you. I don't know how to say that in another better way. That is, he is the way that you can have a peaceful, loving, family relation with God. Instead of being what they call an alienated sinner. That is, you're separated from him until you come to him through the ministry of Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do for you? He did it. He did the following in John 3, verse 16. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Why did he do that? Because he knew what spiritual condition we were in. He knew that we'll never make it to heaven on our own. Somebody had to pay the price of our sins to please God for him to spend eternity with us and give us heaven. Why? Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23 tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The ways of sin, that is what we have earned, is death. We're talking about hell. Death is actually symbolism for hell. We've earned that. The ways of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So you have to believe that his death qualifies him as the son of almighty God. It has made, and, and his death also did something miraculous that nobody else ever has done. He rose from the dead. Amen. That's Psalm 16, verse 8, verse number 11. That was the sign God gave us that he is the son of God, also known as the what? Lord and Savior, that he rose from the dead. Nobody ever found any of Jesus' bones. There's a reason for that. Amen. Because they didn't stay laying there in state. They got up. Amen. Amen. The Bible says that God didn't even allow him to suffer decay. Amen. 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 And that he got up on a special day. He got up on that Sunday morning, guys. Why do you think when the women that first discovered that his tomb was empty... They got there on a Sunday morning. That was a time that the, the tomb was found empty. Amen. I'm so glad it was empty. Because that means he's living. And he's living today for you and I. First Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 and 17 gives us great hope when it comes to Christ coming back. Because if he wasn't living, he couldn't come back. And since he's living, the Bible says that chapter number one, he's going to come back the same way he came. Yes, that he went into heaven, that is. When he was resurrected from the dead, the Bible says he was on the earth for 40 days, teaching more, of the, uh, teaching more about the kingdom to his disciples. And then he was caught up in the clouds yes, to return again one day. That one day is coming. We don't know what it is. You just got to be ready for it. That's what 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16 and 17 talks about. The Bible says that those that have fallen asleep in Christ, another name for dying, they're going to be caught up in the air with him. That means they also going to rise from the dead like he rose from the dead. We're talking about Christians now. And those alive on earth at that very moment are also going to be caught up together in the clouds with them to be forever with Jesus Christ. That's the advantage of having a living Savior. Amen, y'all. Confucius has died. Amen, y'all. Hmm? He can't do nothing for me. Right. Muhammad has died yeah. of Islam. Never got up again. And guess what? He never did a miracle. Mm -hmm. Why would I follow him? Amen. When he never did anything to follow. Mm -hmm. Never did a miracle. 
never got up out of the grave, who is he then? Nobody. Amen. He in the same boat I'm in. That is in Revelation 20, verse 11, 15, every man is going to answer for his deeds in front of Christ. And nobody else. Amen. So I don't know about you, but I would love to have a judge in my favor before I get there. Jesus is a judge. We already got a pass as Christians. Amen, y'all. Amen. See, it looked like to me, from scriptural evidence, that when we get to Jesus' desk, I'm just using symbolism here, y'all. It's just a formality. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Let him on in. Mm -hmm. Amen. I know that one. He's mine. Think about your own house. You had a crowd of people that are there. And some of your friends and some of you don't know what you don't do. You're going to scream them. Mm -hmm. Amen. I know this one. I know that one. I know that one. Come here. But I don't know this tall joker right here. Uh -huh. No, 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 no. I never knew you. See you later. Because you don't know what you're letting in your house. If it's somebody you don't know. But see, the good part about it is, is that what? Jesus knows you ahead of time. Amen. And you will get through those pearly gates and walk down the streets of gold if you believe in him as your Lord and Savior. Now, is that all you have to do? No. But it's the foundation of it. It's the beginning stage. Because if you don't have that faith, you're not going to do the rest, he said. Because you got to believe he's the Son of God, which means your Lord and Savior. So the rest of the plan of salvation is what he tells you to do. That is, he tells you what? To repent. Repent means to change your lifestyle. Commit to living the righteous Christian life and leave a sinful lifestyle alone. Jesus taught that in Luke 13, verse 3 and verse number 5. In fact, his ministry began after he was baptized by John the Baptist in, Mark, in Matthew chapter number 3. What did he preach to the people? His first sermon, everything he ever talked about was repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So you have to take on the Christian lifestyle. You've got to commit to that in order to be saved. The four parts of kind of salvation is what you must say. Romans 10, verse 9, and verse number 10, Acts 8, verse 37 shows us that we must commit to saying literally that we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. God calls that what? Confession. Confession. Then we must go down in the watery grave of baptism to be saved. What is it about the water? It's not the water. It's obedience to what God has commanded. Amen. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you, the water behind me came from gas, and ain't nothing special about that. Amen. What's special about it is that you did what God said and your obedience to going down in the water led to the forgiveness of your sins. It's obedience is what God is actually talking about. You think about this. Come on now. I'm going to use some real common sense with you when it comes to baptism. See if you get it or not. If you can't do the small things, what makes you think God will trust you with anything bigger? Right. Think about it. If I'm going to a mechanic and I want my transmission fixed, if he can't change a tire, why would I go to that man? Right. Serious business. Because what? He can't do the simple stuff. So how can you be trusted with anything bigger? God is asking you to go down in the water to be baptized just like Jesus was baptized. Jesus is not going to tell you to do something he didn't do himself. Amen. 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 How can he be a leader of you and he didn't do it himself? He was baptized. Yes. So why can we say, oh, I don't have to do that? Well, you're not following. You're trying to lead him. Amen. You can't lead the Savior. No, the Savior said you got to be baptized. He said it specifically that you got to do what he did in Mark 16, verse number 16. He said, he that believeth that is yes. baptized. Yes shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. What do you think baptism does? It forgives you. That's when God forgives you of your sins. Acts 22 verse 16. Galatians 3 verse uh, 27. That's when God asks you to Christ, the body. That means you become a part of the family of God. And it what? It's, that's when God changed your status from unsaved to saved. Mark 16 verse number 16. If you understand this, I'm going to tell you one more thing. Baptism literally makes you a Christian. Your, chap your, your status doesn't change to Christian until you're baptized. Mm -hmm. How do I know this? Look at the Pharisees. There was a reason why the Pharisees would not be baptized by John the Baptist. 
Because if they be, were baptized by John the Baptist, they would have become John's disciples. Oh, you didn't get that. When you read the Bible and you read uh, Jesus' ministry, you got to read it from a Jewish perspective. Yes, sir. Not a 2023 perspective in America. Yes, sir. If you do, you will not understand the Bible. That's why he commanded baptism, because baptism was where you were surrendering, becoming a disciple of a teacher. Yes. So that means if you're baptized, the Pharisees were saying that John is my leader. And since they didn't want to acknowledge Christ, they couldn't do that. Because what did John say about Jesus? Behold the Lamb of God mm -hmm. that taketh away the sin of the world. He declared him as the Son of God. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus' enemies certainly were not going to be baptized by John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. Because that would have meant that they would have had to follow Jesus behind. Yeah. All of that. Baptism means I have literally surrendered to becoming a, a disciple, a follower of who I'm being taught by. So obviously then, you can never claim that I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm a follower of Jesus, without going through the water first. That's what the Bible teaches about baptism. Don't let nobody tell you differently than that. I can't change it. No man can change it, and I don't want to change it. Amen, y'all. I don't have the authority to change it, neither do you or anybody out there. Listen to God and not what man says. Man can't put you in heaven or hell. He can influence you to go to hell. Amen, y'all. But at the end of the day, who's going to judge you? God is. And he's going to judge you by his word. When you look at Revelation 20, verse 11, 15, a judgment scene, they were judged by the books. What are the books? The books is the Bible. Amen. What the Bible actually says. Amen. Not what man thinks. So I hope you have been persuaded, not by me, but by what the what word of God actually says. To be saved, again, to summarize it quickly, you got to hear the word of God, which you have done. Believe it concerning Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. Repent of your sins. Confess <laughs> Jesus as the Son of God. Be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and the salvation of your soul. That will put you into Christ. You will become, at that point, a Christian. And all of us that are already in the body. We know Revelation 2, verse number 10 tells us. Jesus puts that commitment in front of us at all times. He says, what? Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He tells us, he that doeth unto the end shall be saved. It is what it is. So we take this opportunity to give you the opportunity as well to give your life to Christ. We just send our song leader forward that sings a verse or two of a song. And that's going to give you the opportunity to come out of your seat. Put one foot in front of the other, and we're going to treat you like royalty. That is, all I'm going to do is ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? If you make that confession, we will go down in the water and grave of baptism behind, you, behind me. You'll come out a new creation. All your sins will be washed away. You'll be saved if you stay faithful unto death. But this time, this is your time. Don't allow yourself to be talked out of giving your life to Christ because you don't know if tomorrow's coming for you or not. You have to do it while the blood is still warm in your veins. Amen. So let's do that right now as together we stand and we sing the Lord's invitation. Won't you come as together we sing? Why do you wait, dear brother? Oh.
I'm standing. Of course, uh, we just like to say Brother Noah Wood did an outstanding job this Amen. morning in bringing the truth. The things that he discussed with us this morning are truth. Amen. And perhaps they'll be there in the desert. Mm -hmm. Out of this time, Brother Stan. <laughs> All right. I won't take much time. I just want the church to know that uh, it's a poor frog that don't pray for fun. My wife has been tolerating me for 42 years, and today is the day of my 42nd anniversary. Amen. All right, well, we uh, would like to wish you a happy anniversary to two of you. And I certainly uh, wish the best going forward. All right, let us pray. The eternal God, our Heavenly Father, we Father, this, this today, this, uh, thanking you for all the great things you've done in our lives. We thank you for waking us up this morning. We thank you for food, clothing, and shelter, and all those things we so often take for granted. So we just thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to be able to be in the assembly this morning. But we realize it, it is our duty to come, but we count it a privilege as well as a pleasure to come and gather with the uh, fellow saints. We just thank you, Heavenly Father, for the message that was brought by Brother Noah Wood. We pray that you bless him and allow him to continue to bring your word. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to not only be hearers of the word, but doers as well. And we pray, Father, for those who uh, stand on the outside of the ark of safety this time, knowing that they have not obeyed, but yet uh, have no interest in obeying. We pray, Father, that you would help them to have a change of heart before it's eternally too late. And that we also pray for those who have heard but have turned aside and seem not to be concerned anymore about the souls. We pray, Father, that you would help them uh, to come to the realization that they're lost without complying with your will and way. And we just thank you, Heavenly Father, for all those who gathered here today. We Pray that you bless each home that's represented here. We pray that love, unity, and peace will prevail in every home. And Father, we just thank you again for uh, the opportunity to, to come, and we just pray that you will help us to encourage one another along the way. Help us uh, to understand better your word in order that we may be better servants in your vineyard. And we pray, Father, for those who are who are downtrodden and brokenhearted, and we just pray that you will bless them. Help them to have a, a brighter future, and pray that you put them on a path to, to uh, a better, a more successful life, a more successful life. We pray, Father, this evening, this morning, Father, for those who are sick and afflicted everywhere. We pray, uh, pray for those of the household of faith everywhere. We know that you know who the sick are, and we know that you're able to help. And we just ask that you intervene and make things better for those who are sick. We, we pray specifically for Sister Williams, who left not feeling well this morning, and pray that you would help her to have a better day, help her to overcome her, her ailment. We also pray for Sister Hook, who's been sick for quite some time, and we pray that you will lift her up and allow her to be back in good enough shape to come to the worship service. And we pray also for her, her family as well. And we pray that you will bless them and help them to help her. We pray, Father, for Brother and Sister Walker, who got healed, and pray that you will help them to overcome. We pray also for the well-being of Kenneth Densmore, who still have issues. And we pray that you will help him to, in his effort to overcome as well. We pray for Gaston Lodge, who's recovering. We pray that you would help him to continue to improve and finally have a complete recovery. Yes. And we pray, Father, for Sister Shirley Jackson and family. We pray that you would help them to overcome whatever obstacles they may have. So we pray for our entire country, Father, for uh, when people are so <clears throat> given to violence this day, we just pray that you would. Uh, Help us all to understand that violence is wrong. We pray, Father, that you help us to never be involved in violence or doing anything to hurt a fellow man. 
And we pray, Father, for those who just seem not to have any regard for human life. And we just pray that you would help us all to be more loving and more peaceful people. And we pray not only for this country, Father, but we pray for those in other countries, especially those who tune in to, to be with us on our weekly broadcast. And we, just, we pray specifically for brothers in Nigeria who we communicate with. We pray for the Darrell Memorial Bible Institute to train ministers. And we pray, Father, for their continued success. And brothers, brother Prince Uche, the director, we yes. Pray, Father, that all will be well with them and help them to continue to be successful. And we pray the same for Brother Mojima, who yes, uh, in Nigeria, who is a hard worker, who uh, spreading the gospel to those who are in darkness on a daily basis. And we just pray for all of the new converts there. And we pray, Father, that perhaps they can come to this country, help this country to be successful. Amen. Spreading the gospel. And Father, we just Pray for Sister Rita Woody and family as they are traveling. Pray for their uh, safe return and pray that all will be well with them. But we pray for others, all of this congregation who uh, may be facing difficulties or sickness and perhaps we don't know about them. We pray that you just help them. And we pray, Father, that you be with us in our daily walk. Help us to not bring to, uh, do things that will bring shame to the church. And we know that there are times when we do things that are contrary to your will and way. We just ask forgiveness of, of, for our sins, and we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would strengthen us and help us to not do those things again. We pray, Father, that you would be with us as we go further into the worship service. All that we see and do may be pleasing and acceptable unto you. In your Son, Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> Morning once again. Morning. 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 We'll come down to this part of the service that is known as the offering. And we uh, know that it's a privilege of ours to be able to give that to the Lord. And uh, we know that we're commanded to do so as well in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. And uh, that, that statement reads Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, and so do you. On the first day of the week, let everyone of you lay by him in store of God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. If there's anyone who needs to submit their offering, please do so. Raise your hand. And so. and remember that if you need to, uh, if you want to give electronically, you can do so using Cash App. And our Cash App handle is a dollar sign followed by Henry S T. COC. Father, we come to you saying thank you again for the marvelous blessing that you've given us. We thank you for um, the uh, various means of uh, employment that you have provided for us and we pray that we'll always be able to uh, just be wise spenders with our funds and we'll be able to take care of our families, but also that we'll always be able to give back a portion of our earnings to you. And we pray that 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 we are given on today was given in a way that's been pleasing to you. And we also pray that um, that the offering that we uh, collected will be used in the best manner possible in order to uh, provide new programs for the church, but also spread the gospel abroad. 
Sing a song of Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. On a hill side, so lonely, little Jesus, one day, so one day, and weary, he went there to pray. My friends there, forsaken, so lonely, he the same manner he also took the cup and he had such sin. This covers the New Testament of my blood. This be you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthy shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh a nation unto himself not discerning the Lord Christ. For this cause men are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Amen. Father, we come to you at this time saying thank you once again for um, your son, and we thank you so much for this fruit of the vine which represents his blood. And we pray that as we partake of it, uh, that, we, that as we partake of it, that we will think about your son's sacrifice for our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
this time we'll lay them ready for in the announcement. Seriously, what, what she's going to say to you. And uh, 